there are seven problems in mathematics that, if solved, will not only earn you a place in the Hall of Fame within mathematics, but also one million dollars. <laughs> In today's video I'm going to be explaining each of the seven problems and I'll also be making separate videos on each of the seven problems with a little bit more detail and going into a bit more depth with those as well. A bit of background on these problems, you may have heard of them already as the Millennium Prize problems and that's because they were established in the year 2000 by the Clay Institute. Now, because there's seven of them, let's dive straight into the first one, which is the Riemann hypothesis. The Riemann hypothesis is actually one of the most famous out of the seven Millennium Prize problems. A lot of mathematicians say that this is the most important problem within mathematics. And if we can solve it, then this will open up a huge gateway into a very specific branch of mathematics and that is prime numbers. Now, before I dive into what the hypothesis is, mathematicians actually believe, or they're, they're almost certain that it's true, that this hypothesis that Riemann proposed is true. And really, we hope that it is, because there are a lot of areas in different fields, like cryptography, that assume that this is true. Okay, so what is the Riemann hypothesis, and what on earth does it have to do with prime numbers? So firstly, prime numbers, if you're not aware, a number is said to be a prime number if it is only divisible by itself and the number one. So the number seven, for example, you cannot divide that by any other number other than seven and one. You might think, okay, well, let's think of different prime numbers that there are. And you might think, as with most things in mathematics and in life, there would be a pattern to it. But interestingly, there actually isn't. We don't have a pattern for prime numbers. And if we did, it would be absolutely groundbreaking because it is used in so many areas, you know, not within just mathematics, but so many different areas as well. So we as mathematicians would love if we could find this pattern, if there is one that is. So that's an overview on prime numbers and why they're important. But what has that got to do with the Riemann hypothesis? So the very famous German mathematician Riemann noticed that the frequency of prime numbers was very closely related to this formula here, which is zeta as a function of s equals the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n to the power s. So this written out would look like 1 plus 1 over 1 to the power s plus 1 over 2 to the power s plus 1 over 3 to the power s and so on and so forth. Now this function is very famous, it's known as the Riemann zeta function and there's one slight subtlety with this. The number s here is complex which makes it a whole lot more complicated in solving. Now going on from this function, Euler actually discovered a relation to this Riemann zeta function and it says that zeta of s is actually the product of p, where p is prime. Now the product means it's a multiplication rather than a sum, rather than adding, so you multiply rather than add, and it's the product of 1 over 1 minus p to the power minus s, where p is a prime number. Now the Riemann hypothesis itself says, well when is this Riemann zeta function equal to zero? And he proposed that it's only ever equal to zero when the real part of the complex number s is equal to a half. And that is Riemann's hypothesis. Now it hasn't been proved, but it has been experimentally tested for the first, I think, 10 trillion solutions. And it's true, it's always a half. But obviously all it would take is one counterexample to say the real part of the complex number is actually not a half. Although 10 trillion of the solutions have shown to be true, all it takes is one counterexample to disprove that. So we really need someone to show a proof of this and to show that yes, it, this function does equal zero when the real part of s is a half. And for me, it's a very beautiful Millennium Prize problem. And I can see why it's a lot of people's favourites. Now, the final thing to mention before I move on to the next Millennium Prize problem is that proving Riemann's hypothesis is not going to show this pattern in prime numbers. It's, it's not going to do that, unfortunately. And I think a lot of people get confused with that and they think that's what it's going to do. But actually, if we prove Riemann's hypothesis, that in itself is going to open a whole new gateway to further development and further advancement in prime numbers. So if we prove this, it will open up the chance to then hopefully find a pattern amongst prime numbers, which yeah, I, I think is absolutely incredible. 
The second Millennium Prize problem that I'm going to talk about today is the Navier Stokes existence and smoothness problem. Now, I might be slightly biased in saying that this is my favourite Millennium Prize problem, and that's just because I specialise in fluid dynamics. So what is Navier Stokes? What, what are they? The Navier Stokes equations essentially describe fluid flow. So that could be air travelling over an aircraft's wing, it could be honey trickling off a spoon, it can be the waves in the ocean, anything that's a fluid, these Navier-Stokes equations describe that. I'm going to show you an image of what these equations look like. And to those of you that don't know vector calculus, they might look quite daunting. But for me, I just think they are so beautiful that there are just some very small set of equations that will describe fluid anywhere on Earth. Although they describe it incredibly well, the understanding of these equations is incomplete. There are certain areas within fluid mechanics, like turbulence, breeze, and all sorts of stuff like that, that we don't fully understand yet. And that's a huge part of what the Navier-Stokes existence and smoothness problem is, is getting that deeper understanding of these equations and seeing if there's anything else that remains hidden with these equations. Now, I personally think it's honestly insane. I remember watching the film Gifted. If anyone has seen the film Gifted, a fantastic film. I've done a video actually explaining some of the maths in that film. And the woman in the film solves this problem, this Millennium Prize problem. And I remember watching this when I was younger and I was just fascinated and I went to university wanting to specialise in fluid dynamics because I was like, I really want to go solve the Millennium Prize problems, albeit quite a, a stretch. Yeah, I, I just, I thought it was a fantastic film and ever since then I've kind of been locked in on, on how cool fluid dynamics is. So yeah, if anyone is interested in fluid mechanics, definitely get involved in it. I really, really love it. And if you go on to do research, you might end up solving this problem, uh, which is the Navier-Stokes existence and smoothness problem. Now, it's not just getting this basic understanding of the Navier-Stokes equations, but some very simple applications of the Navier-Stokes equations have yet to be proved. For a three-dimensional system with some initial conditions, mathematicians have actually never proved that a smooth solution exists, and neither have they found a counterexample. This is a, a kind of a very basic problem, is, is a three-dimensional fluid flow. And yeah, mathematicians haven't been able to prove that a smooth solution always exists or found any counterexamples to suggest otherwise. So although it seems like quite a simple problem, it's immensely complex and that will be a huge part to play in hopefully solving the Millennium Prize problems and being able to understand more about fluid flow in our world and within engineering as well. Millennium problem number three. This is known as the P versus NP problem. Now you may have heard of this because it's related to computer systems. What P versus NP means is P is a problem that is solvable, so it can be solved in what is known as polynomial time, and NP is a problem that can be verified or checked. So it's easy to verify or easy to check. And this is where the debate between if a problem is easy to check, is it solvable and vice versa. Now, if we think of P for a moment, so a problem that's solvable, everything in P is therefore in NP, because if we can solve a problem, we can also check it, we can also verify it. Then comes the question, well, is P equal to NP? So it encompasses everything. So a problem that is easy to solve is always easy to verify. Or is there some case where something that's in NP is not in P? Now, this might sound incredibly complicated, and that's because it is. Uh, I remember watching the series Numbers, and there's a part where the kind of mathematician is trying to solve P versus NP, and I think his professor or somebody comes in and says, you, you're never going to solve it. So it's something in mathematics that, although mathematicians believe P does not equal NP, the proof of it it would be absolutely groundbreaking. So it's a really, really cool concept and I personally really like it because I'm a tech nerd and I love anything to do with computer systems. So I find this really, really cool. Millennium problem number four is the Poincare conjecture. And apologies if I pronounced that incorrectly. So this is the first of the seven Millennium Prize problems to have been solved. And I think the story behind the mathematician himself who solved it is, is quite incredible really, uh, and I'll be getting onto that in just a moment. But firstly, what is this conjecture? So this problem is to do with topology. Now, as a background about topology, it's essentially to do with shapes, but it doesn't concern itself with 
distances. What Poincaré said was if you have an object that has no holes in it and it's finite, it can always be made into a sphere. So as an example, everyone at home, just imagine you have some sort of object made out of Play-Doh and you count the number of holes in it. You know, you might have pierced it or it might be a, say, a teacup that's got a hole with the handle. And what I want you to do is try and somehow in your head, think about how you could make that into a sphere. Now, there are conditions with this. You cannot cut, so you can't cut your object. You cannot glue together and you cannot close any holes. Now, the question is, can you make that into a sphere? So typically, if you chose, okay, I'm gonna have a cube. Like I said, you can squish that down into a sphere and that worked. Whereas if you have a donut, for example, the only way to make a sphere from that donut is to close that hole, to squish it together, or you could cut it and somehow mold it together, but you're not allowed to do that. So therefore, because you had a hole in it, you cannot make a sphere. And that's essentially the concept behind the Poincaré conjecture. Now, Poincaré himself extended this to higher dimensions, which when you think about in your head, it hurts your brain quite a bit. But, you know, we can think of 3D and we can look at 3D objects and it's easy to visually see that. But when you go to higher dimensions, it's much more complicated. And essentially Poincaré himself extended his theory about spheres to higher dimensions. The mathematician who solved this Millennium Prize problem was called Grigory Perelman. And he has a, a fantastic quote behind this. He actually didn't accept the $1 million. And he was also awarded a Fields Medal, which if you don't know, is huge. It's like the Nobel Prize for mathematics. He was awarded this and he rejected it. And he also rejected the million dollars. And he said in a quote, I'm not interested in money or fame. I don't want to be on display like an animal in a zoo. I'm not a hero of mathematics. I'm not even that successful. That is why I don't want to have everybody looking at me which I just, I, I mean, I was just so sad when I read that because I, I understand, you know, he, he probably just does maths because he loves maths. He's just proven the Millennium Prize problem, which is, is absolutely insane. Talk about modesty uh, at its highest. So yeah, that was the Poincaré conjecture and the only Millennium Prize problem so far to have been solved. Now, to solve a Millennium Prize problem, you of course need to know a lot about mathematics. And if you're watching this and you want to learn more about mathematics, or maybe you already have a good background in mathematics, but you still want to learn more, then I would recommend checking out Brilliant.org. Brilliant is a platform where you learn by doing, with thousands of courses in maths, data analysis, programming, and even AI. Each lesson is filled with hands-on problem solving that let you play with concepts, which is a method that's proven to be six times more effective than simply watching lecture videos. Brilliant not only helps you build your critical thinking, but also helps you build knowledge, little by little, each day. My personal favourite courses on their site are the programming course and their course on how LLMs work, both absolutely fascinating. To try out these courses, as well as everything else that Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, then visit brilliant.org forward slash elisitome or click on the link in the description and you'll also get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. We're continuing with the theme of topology with Millennium Prize number five, which is known as the Hodge Conjecture. Now, this is a very, very complicated conjecture and I'm going to be explaining it in very, very brief terms because it is yeah, incredibly complicated. But again, like I said, subscribe for a very deep dive on this Millennium Prize problem. In very simple terms, the Hodge conjecture concerns itself with very complicated shapes in geometry and says, well, can we decompose that shape into smaller, less complicated shapes? It's kind of like Lego, where you have the building blocks to make something that's absolutely insane. Dr. Tom Crawford mentioned that in his lecture that he did on this, and I thought that was a really nice way of thinking about the Hodge conjecture and, and how I personally remember it. So in essence, it's saying, can we build complicated things with smaller things? Now, like I said, topology concerns itself with the shape of something rather than the distance between two points on an object. So like I said, we can have a square and that can be molded into a sphere. Now, interestingly, I mentioned a donut, but a donut can actually be shaped into a teacup. Now that's because a teacup has one hole with the handle and a donut has one hole in the middle. So the two can be formed together in topology and therefore they are classed as the same in topology, just like a cube and a sphere are classed as the same. Now, when you move between different objects that are classed as the same in topology, 
you have what is known as an invariant, and that is something that doesn't change. Now, it's very hard to explain this conjecture in simple terms because it is just so complex, but it has a lot to do with invariance. It essentially has to do with understanding a very specific type of invariant, which is something that doesn't change, that is known as the cohomology class. And it's way too complicated to explain in two minutes, so I'll be making a, a deeper dive video on it and hopefully explain what it's all about. So that was the Hodge conjecture. Now we're moving on to millennium problem number six, and that is known as the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture. In mathematics, we would be right in saying that mathematicians have long been obsessed with equations. You know, all, all you have to do is look at Pythagoras' equation uh, and date that back to when that was first established. Mathematicians love equations. And this conjecture itself is focused on what are known as elliptic equations. So elliptic equations, they take the form y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. Elliptic equations produce some beautiful curves that are known as elliptic curves. And that's basically what this conjecture is about. The conjecture says, okay, well, how many rational points are there on this elliptic curve? So how many fractional points are there for both X and Y when you take a specific point? So we could do this very monotonously and just take points everywhere on the curve, which would be very, very long, infinitely long, actually, when you think about it. And uh, the, the question of the conjecture is, well, how, how many are there? How many of them are fractional points for both x and y? The trick to understanding this conjecture is by the Hasse-Veal L function, which is too complicated again to go into detail on the maths behind it in this video. But what it's used for is, say you have an elliptic curve, you can use this L function to figure out if there are infinitely many fractional points or finitely many. So that in itself is very useful, but this conjecture is huge in number theory and it is known as one of the hardest problems to solve, which makes sense as to why it's a Millennium Prize problem. So that was the Millennium Problem number six. Number seven is known as the Yang Mills Existence and Mass Gap. Almost half a century ago, Yang and Mills discovered a new remarkable framework to describe elementary particles using structures that also arise in geometry. The quantum Yang-Mills theory is now the foundation for most of the elementary particle theory, and its predictions have been tested at many experimental laboratories, but unfortunately, the mathematical understanding is still unclear. And that's what the Millennium Prize problem is about. It's about understanding this theory. Now, to successfully use this Yang-Mills theory, there is one thing that is needed, and that is known as the mass gap. This property has been discovered by physicists using both experimental work and through computers, but unfortunately the theoretical side of things is yet to be established. And that is why it's such a huge problem and why it is a Millennium Prize problem, arguably one of the hardest and one of the most fundamental when it comes to physics. Again, the Yang-Mills theory is incredibly complicated, just like all of the previous six Millennium Prize problems. So if you're interested, I'll be doing a deep dive on it in a separate video but that was the final Millennium Prize problem. And honestly, I'd love to know what everyone's thoughts are on all of them, which one you think is your favorite. Comment down below your favorite. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all in the next one.